Right, so folks, here we go, another episode, and um, one that's quite poignant, I guess, be a good word, um, quite timely. So regular listeners will know that my uh, my dad passed away in late June, and it's already been like, it's been three months now since since that happened. And so, yeah, my dad's, my, my dad had a, had a condition called myotonic dystrophy, um, which is a, basically a muscle wasting disease. So it was... Um, was I was always kind of waiting for it to happen. You know, I'd, I'd always re- rehearse the phone call in my head, waiting for every time my mum rang and it was after 7 p.m. For years, it was always like, oh God, this this is that phone call. And I always sort of feared it happening because, you know, lesser things, again, regular listeners will know, less, lesser things have, have sort of broke me in the past. You know, bank, bankruptcy of mine from 10 years ago nearly sort of almost drove me to suicide. And then my dad's like losing one of my parents. I just felt, God, if that happens, that's really going to push me over the edge. But it didn't. In fact, nowhere near, you know, I'm fine um, and I'm going to be fine. And I don't know, it's actually sort of made me realise that I'm not made of glass after all. Um, but it's it's not been the experience that I thought it was going to be. And it's my guess that the experience of bereavement, of grief for a lot of people is that experience that it wasn't what they expected it to be. You know, I don't think, I think a lot of people like, you don't know how you're going to handle it because we're not taught how to handle it. You know, what's like, what's the procedure? We don't talk about death, especially in the West and in, in this country, we sort of shy away from it. Um, well, not today. Today, we're going to confront it head on. So my guest today is Julia Samuel. Julia is a psychotherapist and pediatric counsellor specialising in grief. In 1994, she helped launch and establish Child Bereavement UK, which is a charity aimed at educating professionals in supporting children facing bereavement and families who have lost a child. And she continues to play an active role as the charity's founder patron. Julia is a vice president of the British Association for Counselling and Psychotherapy, an honorary doctor of Middlesex University, and in 2016 was awarded an MBE in the New Year's Honours List for her services to bereaved children. Her first book, and the reason I reached out to Julia to speak on this topic, is Grief Works, Stories of Life, Death and Surviving, which was published in 2017. So, Julia, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, so I know you you specialise in, or seem to specialise in childhood bereavement, but I think that's sort of, I think that's maybe a topic all of its own to, to do somewhere further down the line. So for now, I just want to sort of focus on grief more broadly, um, not to exclude the the experience of children and childhood, but just painting a, a broader picture. So as always, before we before we dive into that, if you could tell us a little bit about you, um, your history, and specifically what made you want to become um, a grief counsellor, because I believe you was in publishing originally before you came into this, but yeah, a, a bit of your History, tra- trajectory, please. I hate that word. I think anyone who's, um, well, I think all of us in whatever profession we're in, we're very influenced by our own experiences and our childhood. And I think there were multiple reasons that, you know, unbeknownst to me, I had no idea I was heading in this direction. It certainly wasn't what was ever expected of me Um that got me to be a grief psychotherapist. So I, 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 the, I think the sort of home reason from my childhood was that both my parents, um, my mum and my dad, had multiple um, deaths before they were 25. So by the time my mother was 25, her mother, her father, her sister and her brother had all died. So that was her entire family. And my dad, his father and his brother and at home, when I was a child, there were these black and white photographs of these people who were never, ever talked about, which was um, both my grandfather's, my grandmother, and my mother's two only siblings, her brother and sister. Her brother was killed in the war, and her sister died very suddenly of an asthma attack. And um, I never knew anything about them. I barely knew their name. And when I was in my sort of... Um, late 20s I asked my mother about them and she spoke as if it was yesterday as if she was this 18 year old girl which she was when her brother died and she was at Edinburgh 
at a cookery school and someone caught, walked in and asked her to come out. They told her that her brother had been killed in Arm, Arnhem. She walked back into the class. She never told anybody. She never mentioned it again. She went to a Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers film that evening and she never, ever talked about her brother, her favourite brother. But when she talked to me all these decades later, it was as if it was yesterday. She was, it was that grief that was untouched and unresolved. It was like a live video in her body. Why, why was that? Why do you think, it, is that a generational thing that it just didn't, it wasn't the done thing? It was, I think it was actually a survival mechanism of my mum was the generation whose parents fought in the First World War who every person in the First World War was affected by someone that died. They either had a, a son or a brother or a father um, or a husband. And so th there was no one to support them. You know, Queen Victoria had been the kind of poster woman for grief and bereavement and the grieving process, wearing black her entire life after Albert died. But the First World War wiped out 17 million people plus the flu no one could grieve. They had to just survive and get on, procreate, bring home the bacon. So my mum was brought up by that generation. And then they were the generation that fought in the Second World War. So again, they were under pressure to survive. There was no way they could process this much loss. And I think me as the next generation, to some extent, were had the sort of luxury to be able to grieve because we weren't under threat. And if you're in fight or flight, you can't grieve. So if you're traumatized, you can't grieve until you've processed the trauma. If you're under threat, you can't grieve. You have to be able to allow your feelings to emerge in their own time and be supported. Because it's really the love of others when someone dies that is what enables us to survive. Yeah, I guess, I mean, even though... Like you've made that distinction between the, the the generations of how they they would have dealt with death and the um, the circumstances that would have influenced that. I think it's fair to argue that even now, death is it's a super taboo subject. And it's the first line of my book. Death is still taboo. Yeah, but in in a really in a really sort of in a really strange way in you know especially nowadays everything's talked about everything from you know sex and men mental health and everything is talked about but it's still it's it's not talked about publicly very much but i mean you wouldn't sit down with your your friends in a pub <laughs> and 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 discuss it either and i'm just wondering why why you think that is have your friends not talked to you about your dad dying not at all um no i have to broach i have to sort of bring it up yeah. it, it's it's sort of the it's the elephant in it's been the elephant in the room and then i bring it up and then it makes it okay to sort of be acknowledged but it, the few people i've sort of spoke to about it i'm very open about it it's, i can yeah yeah and especially you know with people that have been through the same thing i'm, I'm open to sort of sharing the experiences but i kind of get the feeling that when you are talking about it people are just waiting for you to run out of things to say to move on to the next part of the conversation, but not in a in an ignorant way. Not that it's they're not trying to be rude. It's just oh, this is awkward. The awkwardness just permeates the entire conversation. I think so. I think that's the key to it. Really, is because people don't talk about it, people are very um, ignorant. And when they're ignorant, it brings up lots of fears. It brings up the fear of maybe I'm going to say something wrong. It brings up a fear, I think, of facing their own mortality. Maybe if I talk about death, it'll happen to me. It makes it more real. Most of us like to live in sort of blissful ignorance. Death happens to other people yeah. that you read in the, in the papers. It doesn't really happen to me. And also, it's uncomfortable. Someone who's really grieving very deeply and in a lot of pain, they transmit a lot of discomfort through their body which the other person picks up and that person you can't you're powerless with grief you can't fix it you know so if you've got a broken leg I can say here's a stool to put your leg on let me get you a glass of water come on hop along but if you're grieving it's invisible and you're powerless to fix it so people always want to come up with something to make it better and then they realize they actually can't make it better because the person has died mm. and can't fix that. So they'd rather change the subject. It just 
brings up too many things that they don't understand and they don't know. And then a furious when it happens to them and nobody else understands them because the thing they want to be is understood. So you sort of mentioned the the, the, the formative experience of, of why you may have had a, an interest in it as, a, as an emotional experience. But again, I'm interested in why make the leap of, right, I'm actually going to work in this because to work in this area, you're going to be on the front line. You're not just going to be with people that have that are dealing with bereavement, but also with people that are dying and going through that process. And that's... Put on. It's full on, Julia, and it's it's something that I, I it's it's beyond me. I, I couldn't I couldn't do it, especially with children. Ever since becoming a dad, I can't even you know I watch kids fall over and and, and like break their arm in a in a TV drama, and it, I, even that gets me. And so to do that in real life is is seems a pretty intense decision. So what what was the what was the motivation there? I think it's I'm a, I'm a twin, so um, I have a twin brother, and I think I really get something from connection deep connection to others i want i always want to kind of be in relationship and being a psychotherapist um you have very powerful and intense relationships and i think also and i always feel a bit embarrassed about this i want to be needed because it makes me feel i'm of worth or i'm useful or and um and i want to sort of want to be able to help but not in a way that I think, you know, I, I don't really believe in altruism. I think you do what you do because it does something for you, not mm. because you're being good or something. So I, I don't do this because I'm good because I'm no, I'm as much a bitch as the next person. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I really, I get something myself from doing this work. And it is very odd. I mean, I, honestly, I can't believe, you know, my husband, I was talking to someone on the telephone or a journalist the other day because somebody died. And my husband of 40 years looked at me and he said, God, what you do is bloody odd. As if mm-hmm. <laughs> I've been doing it for 28 years as if it was new. But I mean, it is odd. Yeah. Have you, have you ever, have you ever been, been there for someone as they've passed? Uh, has, that, has that been part of your? Yeah. Because I mean, it's a whole section of my book, Facing Your Own Death. So I, I've got a, a client now who's dying. Um, and so, yeah, I've worked with a lot of people who are dying. And I've worked with children that are dying. Yeah, th- see, f- that for me was. So I was I was there when me when my dad passed, and it was it. Was, I had to make the decision to remove his, his. Can I battle with you about something? Yes. So one of the difficulties about grief to being a taboo is that we use all these meta- we use all these metaphors like past. Mm. Your dad didn't necessarily pass; he died. Mm. He didn't didn't lose him, didn't lose him in Sainsbury's or in the back of the car park. He died. And then whatever your belief system is. But when people say passed or passed over, lost, it's a metaphor because we can't quite face the reality of the fact that he died. Well, you know what, Julie, it's funny you say that, actually, because um, I'm, I am comfortable with that, with the word died. I, the, the reason I'm, I'm using the word past is I'm, I'm sort of being... Gentle. I'm trying to be sensitive to the listener, but I t- no, I totally agree with you. Um, there's been certain. You said at the beginning we're going to face death full on. Yeah, ex- yeah, totally. Um, yeah, there's been certain conversations that have that have happened since my dad died, and you know where people try and be sensitive about it, and they say things like, "Oh well, he, you know, he's 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 watching, he's looking down on you now, and things like that." And I just think, "Oh, sure, he's dead." And I do say that he's dead. It's just you know it, things like that sort of irritate me. Um, but I think to add to that, I think you know my parents' generation were very much forget and move on, and what you don't think about isn't going to hurt you. And I think now what we understand from all the research and theories that we've developed in the last fifty years, of which there's an enormous amount, is that the person, the reality is the person has died, so they're not present in your life anymore. But the love and the relationship continues. And I, I, one of the kind of theories that we talk about is continuing bonds. So it's often that what people do to avoid the pain of the loss or to kind of forget the person that has died that does them harm. And actually, if they can, like you have, 
um, support yourself to manage the reality of loss, face the pain of it, you then do psychologically adjust. I talk about it as accommodation. You accommodate the reality that they've died, but actually then you start kind of feeling them in your body. And you may have a belief system that they're in heaven looking down at you or they're in your heart or you wear their watch and that's a kind of touchstone to their memory. And so the relationship continues. Yeah, it does. That's that's something that's slowly sort of developing as a, a as I go along with it and figuring out what what my role is now in in sort of taking my dad's place. So you could say to your dad in your mind or talk to him in the sky or whatever people pray or whatever it is. Dad, you know, what, what son what school should I send my child to or what are we going to do about mum she's da 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 and you would get an answer yeah that you know what the way I think I am sort of I've done that direct communication thing a couple of times you know when you send in the same way that you tend to sort of talk to yourself sometimes out of frustration or boredom but when I, I've consciously spoken out to my dad there's there's a voice in my head going shut up he's you know what I mean he's he's not out there but the way that does work for me is wondering having known my dad for as long as I did what would my dad say about this situation what would no. and and that's that seems that's enough for me that's enough of a, of a of a connection sort of um his his sort of enduring legacy as pure memory not not as thinking of him as being out there somewhere um, but also there's you, people, I mean, I talked about it in my book, that you can people can develop it. Like if their mum dies, they can make her favourite lasagna. Or you can do mm. the work that you did with your dad or going to the football match you used to go to mm. with your dad or wearing his football scarf or any of the things that connect you to them, bring them close. And that is, it's very, very comforting and healing. Yeah, one thing I'm interested in, Julia, is when you first went into into this profession, obviously there's a difference between theory and practice. So before you got to actually work with people, it's, you know, it's it's mostly theory. You read in the books and, and et you cetera. You with other poor counsellors. You, you practice together. You role play. Well, I'm interested in maybe if, if you could share maybe a couple of your most sort of formative experiences when it, in the early days when it went from, from theory to practice. So um, my first sort of proper job was in the NHS, was at St. Mary's Paddington. And um, I had to persuade a bunch of doctors who felt that, you know, talking to the parents who'd had a baby die at that point, it was just the baby, not a child, talking to them six weeks after the death would be enough. And I, I mean, I was, I didn't know what I didn't know. So at 30, I thought I knew everything and I'd done kind of two years training <laughs> And I marched in very confidently, which absolutely astonishes me now, <laughs> and said, you know, I should come and, and counsel these um, parents. And they gave me a room, which was literally a broom cupboard. It was where they kept equipment. There was no window. It was sort of boiling hot and dark and dank. And one of the first um, couples I saw, they, they were furious with themselves and furious at life. And I didn't expect them to be so angry. I expected tears. I had my box of tissues and my kind of glass of water and my um, kind of empathy for their sadness. I did not expect this kind of <laughs> fury. But fury is an expression of hurt. And they'd been robbed of this baby that they um, had every right to expect. And so... That was quite quite a shock. And actually, soon after that, I started kickboxing. And um, and I've done it ever since. So I got this guy who's been teaching me ever since. And we've agreed we're going to do it into our kind of 80s. We're going to meet a bit, a bit slower in 20 years time. Anyhow, but I punch him for an hour every week. And he can't believe how much I want to hurt him. But it's, it's, very, it's very good as the other side of being... Um, gentle and warm and kind of sitting so doing something where I can express a lot of my powerlessness or anger at what I've heard helps sort of balance me yeah I guess that's one of the things that 
I kind of alluded to it in in the introduction, sort of counterintuitive responses to it, where I don't I don't know if that's so much counterintuitive. The idea of losing a child. I mean, I I don't even like thinking about that for more than a couple of seconds. Um, but yeah, I'm wondering what are maybe what what are some common counterintuitive responses that people experience. The reason I'm asking this, it was uh, Carol Vorderman was speaking yeah. about it a few months back and her experience was that um, she had a really close relationship with her mum I think they lived together and then when her mum passed I think she said she she felt pretty much nothing and then it wasn't until a year later she said it all came up on one day she cried her eyes out and then when it was done she sort of carried on again and the reason I think this is an important question is I, I imagine there can be a lot of guilt attached to not having the right response. You know, when someone close to you dies, it feels appropriate that you fall to your knees, strike your eyes out for maybe days on end, maybe a few months of depression. But for those people where, and I, I think I felt this a little bit, where within a few days you're sort of back on your feet, there's a bit of guilt there. And so I think it'd be good to hear a few examples of of that to you know to anyone out there basically who's who's feeling guilty and thinks that they're the only one that's reacted like this so i think there you know there are many ways to grieve and there's certainly no one right way to grieve so some people find themselves having a surprising amount of sex after someone has died and in a way it's a natural instinct to want to, to it's, you know sex is a way of having life for life mm. and it's mm. almost like a fight against death but they can think afterwards, you know, it's not them prostrate on the, on the, as you say, on the floor wailing. It's them actually jumping around in bed or wherever it is with, with someone which they wouldn't expect, so they feel guilty. But grief is a physiological process. It's a natural process. And we need to let it find its way of being expressed. And each of us have, our own way. So it's about giving ourselves permission to let it out. And, and, you know, I think if you really love someone, you think that I should really show that by not coping. And you give yourself a certain amount of time, three months, six months, a year. Certainly your bosses give you probably a month, you know, where you're allowed to grieve and then you're not. And if there's a mix, a mix, a mismatch between, what you've kind of given yourself as a prescription and what you do, you feel wrong. But in fact, what happens is it's much more an oscillation. It's a moving in and out. So it may be you'd be fine for a couple of days and then suddenly you'd smell something that reminded you of your dad. Maybe it was, you know, what he drank or you saw somebody wear something similar or someone who looked like him from behind and you'll be hit by a kind of wave of loss and if you let it run through your system, it can be gone within 10 minutes or an hour. But also, if you have no regrets, it sounds like you had a very good relationship with your dad. There weren't things that you wished you'd said. You didn't feel guilty. You kind of, in a way, you had a, a, a pre-bereavement. So you had a living loss. You you grieved a lot of his dying before he died. That's totally uh, true, the, yeah. All those telephone calls. So in a way you've done a lot of the work already. Mm. How would, like in the, in the Carol Vorderman example? I think that is very surprising, by the way. Go on. Well, she, we each learn to grieve by um, observing the adults around her, us. So she, in some ways it's not surprising because her mum was like, my generation was like, get on and carry on. And Carol Vorderman is obviously an amazing woman who's because their father left them. They had no money. They lived in a tiny kind of bed sit. And as Carol's life got better, she took her mum with her. But all she knows how to do is to fight and get on. And so in a way, but her mum was a central part of her life. So what's surprising was that she wasn't flawed by it. But in other ways, it isn't surprising because she doesn't know how to grieve. She has no mechanism in her body or in her being that lets her feel hopeless and helpless. She only really knows how to fight and how to get on. Okay. So you, I slightly worry about that. 
what what would you say to to a, a client of yours that was going through that experience? Like how how do you reconcile that? Because like the example you were just giving then of um you, you sort of, you feel nothing and then something hits you, something reminds you of that person, but you know maybe someone's not even having that experience. Maybe they're trying to manufacture that experience. What would your advice be to people that f- maybe feel I'm not grieving enough? I would give them ways to remember. So maybe make a memory book with photographs or write down memories that you or put to, together a memory box of, you know, their spec case, old cards that they'd given you, um, a brooch, a handkerchief, you know, anything that reminds you of the person. So it's a place you can go to to remember. And you just need to give yourself some time to do that, whether it's 20 minutes, whether it's an hour. And then do something to support yourself afterwards. So I, I, I had a client, um, Cheryl, who was second generation um, Jamaican. Her mum had come over on the Windrush or an equivalent boat. And her mum, she had an abusive dad and her mum was um, like fight and get on. And the one thing she really wanted was her children to do better than she had was to be educated. And her daughter had done really well. She was a pediatric nurse and... But two years after her mum had died, she came to see me and it wasn't because she didn't miss her mum, it was because she felt nothing. She felt absolutely none, but that that numbness felt like emptiness. She felt like a sort of um, empty vessel. And what happened is that in order to do what her mum had always taught her, she cut back, shut down on her capacity to feel pain which then, of course, always cuts down your capacity to feel joy. So your capacity to feel becomes very tinny and thin. And so her engagement with life was very narrow. And actually, we only needed six sessions. I asked her to bring in something that reminded of her of her mum, and she brought in a scarf. And she brought in a brooch, and she showed me the brooch, and she remembered it sort of being on her mum's jacket. And then she smelt the scarf. And it was like her whole, all those defences that had been shut down for two years just opened before us. And she remembered her mum. She remembered sitting on her lap as a little girl. Mm -hmm. She remembered all the sort of visceral smells and hugs and connection with her mum. And then she could allow herself to miss her mum. And then she got on with it. You know, her mum was 85. She died, you know, as a sort of expected death, not in pain, so... So just leading into that then, you said that there's no there's no right way to grieve. But I'm wondering if there's sort of almost objectively maybe, or just based on research or experience, is there a wrong way to grieve? Well, the research is that 15% of all psychological disorders come from unresolved grief. So, which is a big old chunk, as I can see in your face. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, and it can be transgenerational. So we can go through generations of not grieving losses of grandparents that were killed in the war, of people that died suddenly of suicides that are kind of hidden transgenerationally, that is passed down viscerally through our systems. So I think as much as I say there isn't a wrong way to grieve, as long as you're grieving, it's okay. But if you really use work sort of is an anesthetic so being incredibly busy blocks you feeling and the one that's most common is alcohol and drugs so if you use things to anesthetize the process of grieving then you're likely to do yourself harm because you shut down but also when you have another loss it puts you in touch with the previous loss which then boom you're in trouble yeah, so it's like it's just further further postponing and compounding the the effect, I guess. So, well, you kind of touched upon it there. Be a, a good little segue. This is that the the idea of, of clinical disorders, and um, I guess a bit of a controversial topic. This the the inclusion of grief in the DSM, the DSM five, and I think it's based around. I think the, the controversy seems to surround the, the the time limit. I think it's something like two weeks, as early as two weeks. You can be diagnosed with clinical depression based on unresolved grief. Yes. Um, 
I'm wondering what you think of that, of grief being included in the DSM at all as being considered its its own form of depression. When does grief become a disorder, if ever? Well, on the one hand, I'd like to say it's bollocks, if I'm allowed to swear. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, to set a kind of um, framework of, you know, after this amount of time, you, you should have done your grieving. And if you haven't done it, it's a disorder. Whereas I think about it as a sort of, in some cases, a lifelong process of, of adjustment. I mean, there'll be plenty of times in that life that you won't think about the person that died, but then 10 years later, it can feel like yesterday for whatever reason, and you need to allow that to come through your system. I think the thing that's helpful about it is that in this sort of hidden taboo world of bereavement and grief, the fact that it's raised its flag that grief is um, going to affect most people and so that it has um, appeared on the DSM-5 gives it a kind of importance that it hasn't been given. I think if when you have properly unresolved grief, that is way, way, way past what we would understand as feeling sad, being angry, feeling switched off, not being able to sleep. It's when you really don't function. And that's when you have some kind of depression that's combined with the grief. And there is a difference between grief and depression. I mean, I know you've on your blog, you've talked about depression and there are many different kinds of depression. There's anxious depression. There's the kind of black depression where you can't move. And, but none of it is reactive to an event. Whereas grief is an active reactive process. But I think, uh, when it becomes depression is when um, you almost lose sight of the person that's died. It's not like the grief anymore. It's just hopelessness and there's no hope and helplessness because with grief, you have hope that tomorrow you will feel a bit better or you have a future. And I think without hope you have despair. And I think that's the alchemy that can send you down or up. Well, I think we've sort of got a, um... A kind of a perfect cocktail for grief becoming that in in this country we mentioned you know death is a, it's a taboo subject and people have a tendency to to bottle it up or to try and use drugs and alcohol to, to numb the pain so they're not actually dealing with the grief and then their friends and closest to them don't talk to them about it because they don't know how or they send them a text like i hope you get better soon or you know and let me know if there's anything i can do and then do nothing lots of texts yeah. And I see, I mentioned in the intro that over in the West, we maybe don't de deal with it in the right way. And, you know, I'd, I've said that, but I haven't really got, I haven't really got any evidence for that. I mean, I've not really researched it. It's a bit of a bit of a cliche to, to make that statement. And we often hear that, oh, you know, in over in the East or in different countries, South America, for instance, that the, the dead. yeah, the day of the dead, they've got a better relationship with death and they deal with it better. For one thing, I'm just wondering if, if you think that's actually the case. And then what kind of, is there any things, ideas, rituals that we could maybe import from them that would help us out, I guess? I mean, I don't know that much, although I, I know uh, probably more than you, <laughs> hopefully. So in, the, <laughs> in China, for instance, um, you go on um, the corner of the street and you burn ashes, you burn paper to sort of show that you're grieving. But th there's no proper funeral. There's no kind of real rituals in China. It's very much like get on with it. Wow. And, and um, in Japan, you have your ancestors. So you have this um, part of your house. It may be your front room. It may be somewhere else where you have a kind of temple to your ancestors. So they're very much influencing you and seem to be part of um, your present life, that the past is part of your present. But the, and as you, as we said, as we said in South America, there's this ritual every year and there's, it's sort of a Catholic ritual of the day of the dead where people parade through the streets. Um, it's our All Souls Day actually, but we don't remember All Souls Day was a day to remember the dead, which it was, it's in November. Um, but the actual kind of messy, hidden, underneath process of grieving and feeling the pain, 
I don't think, I think all the countries um, don't really acknowledge it. So some have different rituals and different ways of expressing it, but I still think there's an enormous ignorance about how people actually feel it and what actually helps them. Have you got... Um, Exercise really helps, by the way. What's that? Exercise really helps. Exercise. Well, like you said, you do your, your kickboxing. and um, What do you think that is as well? Do you think that's a, a, a sort of physical release of, of anger, frustration? I think it's... Uh, so. Our emotional system is called the autonomic nervous system. It works parallel to the central nervous system. And when we're grieving, it's grief is embodied. We feel it in our bodies. People often sort of touch their chest or their heart or men rub their legs. So it's very physiological. And we hold it tight. And this thing of it being invisible. And it feels like fear often. People feel frightened. It feels like anxiety because the world, as you know, is different. The reality, you don't feel so safe. And death seems around the corner. So the actual act of running or fighting, doing something physical, hitting a ball, is the external uh, system telling your body you've flown or fought. And then it releases the um, neurons to say that you're not in danger anymore. So it gives you the serotonin that winds down your system. So when you're grieving, your system goes into a very tight kind of (gasps) holding your breath, uh, looking for danger, and actually running, flying or or fighting tells your body you're not in danger anymore because you've done the flight. And so you feel much calmer. And a a combination of running and doing, saying, a 10-minute meditation and then giving yourself a really nice treat, whatever that is, whether it's delicious cup of coffee or buying yourself some flowers or me it's coffee toast food all of that um you feel much better i just want to talk about your book for a moment so i know it's it it consists of the i guess the most impactful experiences um that, that, that you've had over the years and i just wondered if you'd maybe could maybe briefly share a, a couple of like sneak previews and all these plenty to, to go on in the book, but I'm not quite sure what type of experiences I'm, I'm most interested in. Maybe the ones that stuck with you the most and maybe one that's, that was a very sort of counterintuitive or confusing experience for you professionally as well, maybe. I mean, So the case studies are divided up um, by the relationship with the person that died. So it's when a partner dies, a parent dies, a sibling dies, a child dies, and facing our own death. So there are three case studies of people I work with for each of them. And in some ways, they're not the most memorable because I wanted to make them most accessible. Okay. So I make the most extreme um, because I wanted it to you know, 700,000 people die every year. So I wanted the majority of people to sort of have something that they could connect to. Right. And that's why I did it, so they'd have the, an understanding of the experience for themselves. I think what, um, I mean, the saddest ones undoubtedly are the ones with, with the children dying. Um, they're the ones that people find hardest to read, but also sort of incredibly poignant and give them uh, a different perspective about what happens in life. So and Julie, think- this, this is going to be, this is going to sound like almost like a stupid question, but I think it's one that deserves to be fleshed out a little bit. The question is, why is the, the loss of a child? Why does that trump all the other types of grief? And I get like, say on the face of it, it's like, well, duh, but why, why that? Why? Well, duh, why is it so troubling? Because the reverse of nature, it's the um, it's the death of your future as you expect it. You never expect to bury your child. You expect them to bury you, mm. and often they represent meaning in your life. That you that everything that you believe in and that you work for is for the next generation. The love that you feel, how they look like you, how they're going to remember you after you've died. But if you end up burying them age six or 13 or 26 at that point everything that you trusted in about life and the cycle of life 
is stopped at that moment. And also, there are very few people who have children die. So it's only, I mean, it's not only because it's way too many, but 5,000 children die a year. And so you're a rare, you're part of a club that nobody wants to be a member of. Um, I mean, more babies die because one in four pregnancies ends in miscarriage, one in a hundred stillbirth. So that's a bigger number. Whereas in the Victorian times, so in the Victorian times when the population was, I don't know, about 10 million or something, a um, hundred thousand children died a year. 1905, a hundred thousand children died. In 2005, 5,000 children died. So it's the absolute, we expect the minute we get through a hospital door, if, some, if your child is ill or you're pregnant, that the doctor is going to fix it. You think technology is going to sort you out. And when you find actually you're at the mercy of forces that you have no control of and that everything you expected in life and what you believe in is wiped out, you have to reconfigure everything, your relationship with yourself, with people around you. So seeing your friends who've now got still got, still got the children they had, you can hate those friends that you used to love. Or your mom doesn't know how to talk to you anymore because she's still got a daughter, she's got you, and yet you've lost your daughter, your daughter has died. So it it, it turns everything upside down. Okay. Um, sorry, Julie, I think you was going to um, share, before I went off on that little tangent then, we was talking about some of the stories in your book. So I just wondered if there was an, a, another one you wanted to, something specific you wanted to, to relay about it. I mean, I think one of the ones um, is uh, someone who's, uh, again, it was a story of someone whose um, mother had died. And she was someone who was successful. She passed exams. She was good at her business. And she couldn't believe how thrown she was by the death of her mum. And the thing that was difficult for her was her husband was like, come on she's been dead four months now, or come on, she's been dead six months, I want my wife back, I am fed up with you not wanting to go out, being miserable, not wanting sex, forgetting everything, um, not really being jolly with the children, uh, crying all the time, and so, and that's very common. Is Is it? Yeah. You will look quite lucky. (laughs) Apparently so. God. Yeah, well, you know what, Julie, that's, I mean, that's a question I hadn't thought of as well, but I mean, what is someone to do when they are going through the grieving process and they're not getting the support from from people around them? Then, because, you know, your family, your friends, they're the most important support network during the grieving process, but if they're not there, then what the hell do you do? I I mean, I think what's difficult is that you have to educate them. So you, you feel so furious because you're upset and then you have to explain to the people that you should know better what you need and what they need to do but unless you're explicit people it it causes a lot of ruptures in relationships so in my book there's a whole section on how friends and family can help and so for for partners um, husbands or wives it's doing both it's allowing them to be sad but also taking them out to go for a walk or making sure that they do, although they don't want to, to kind of do something that's nice for them. Not so nice that you expect them to sing and dance and kind of um, be their most happy, but do things that feel like a break from the grieving that gives you both an opportunity to have a nice time. Okay, so I read uh, an interview with you and um, I'm just going to give you throw a little quote out. You look worried. Don't look worried. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> so th- I'm, I'm quoting you now, and this is you talking about the doing this as a, as a, as a career. You said that um, knowing that bad things can happen at any point has left me with a slightly skewed view of the world. I imagine the worst first. If one of my four grandchildren has a headache, I'm convinced it's a brain tumour, and I'm super worried when my daughters are pregnant. I'm that much fun. <laughs> you see, I mean, you've, you've you've sort of summarized it there, but I'm wondering how doing this job over the years has affected you personally, and but more specifically, if there are any sort of seminal moments that affected you 
uh, and maybe even experiences where you've thought I can't can't do this anymore so I mean I think it's done both so on the one hand it's really taught me about what really matters so if I'm jumping up and down furious because something ridiculous has happened like I've lost my keys or I don't know you know all the stuff one gets crossed by my husband's put my white shirt with his blue shirt or something as if you do the washing but anyway (laughs) um I do I do have a kind of a third eye that says shut up you know this doesn't matter so it changes my perspective about what matters and I think it helps me really relish life and my my own life and the life of people I love so I think I'm much more grateful than I would be otherwise where you I don't just assume it's going to be okay so I feel very very grateful so that's a really positive thing um I mean it's true I do feel much more scared because I that's what I deal with it's what I see you know a lot of the time so my my view is skewed and there are times where I can't take on more clients so there are times of the year when I just I can't do anymore it's too much and then I have to sort of stop. I mean, I, I always stop at the end of July. And by the end of July, I, I take August off and I go walking in Scotland. And that's just like being in those big old hills that have been there for millions of years, that have survived all of our kind of machinations and mortality. And and I find that very healing. But I need those those connections with nature and different kind of perspective and walking that that – that, that then gives me the energy to start again and then when I, when I look forward to it like at this September I was like really ready before you did this job though was you did you have a tendency to, towards anxiety and to catastrophize then or is that as a direct result of doing this job no I didn't give a shit about anybody I just cared about parties <laughs> <laughs> do you... and having fun I wasn't at all anxious do you ever have to see anybody and, and speak to anybody like a therapist yourself as as, yeah. as a direct result of, of doing this? So in the training, you have to have a therapy. So you have to know yourself. You have to know, I have to know what my vulnerabilities are, what my triggers are, what I'm, what I'm likely to respond to it with a particular person. So, I mean, I had therapy for years and years, but also, um, I'm, as an accredited therapist, I have to have supervision. So I have a supervisor who's a qualified therapist who I talk about my caseload to every month. And then I have a supervision group of other therapists. So, yeah, you have to have system. I have to have systems that keep me on track, that I'm doing it right, but also as a way of downloading. I think everyone should have it, really, to be honest. Have you... Um... Well, like you said we've got we've got to talk directly. I've, I'm always sort of conscious about asking too personal a question, but I'm wondering whether you've had you've experienced a bereavement that when it happened, everything you know sort of went out the window, and and you struggled to deal with it, or when it happened, were were you able to put all these things you know into practice and actually make it a a smooth process? I guess. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I've had really good friends die very suddenly and I've had young family die very suddenly. And it's both. Like, I I really hate, I hate that feeling of being so upset and being in so much pain and not knowing what to do with myself and wanting it to go away and wanting to kind of take drugs to make it go away. But I do also have enough knowledge that I know that doesn't bloody work. Right. So although I want a kind of main line, whatever it is that would stop me hurting, I don't actually drink or anything, but um, I force myself out to go for a run. I force myself to cycle. And then I watch happy telly, things like Mamma Mia 2, and, <laughs> and, <laughs> with happy endings and ridiculous stories. And I journal and I talk to friends and I cry with friends and I drag friends to come walking around the park with me. Um, so it's both, it's as messy and painful and difficult and shit for me as it is for anybody else, but I tend not to do the stuff that makes it worse. You never feel cured of it. You never think, oh, I've got this grief business sorted. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. I can show you how to do it so you don't feel anything. <laughs> yeah. You don't sleep, you wake up, you know, all that stuff. I, it doesn't stop you being human, unfortunately. My final question, and quite a big question, and this is one I'm going to have to do an episode. <laughs> big. So how big is this? This is the biggest of all, I think, at least from a, an existential standpoint. So I've always had a, a very sort of close relationship with death, at least in the abstract. I kind of, I like to think anyway, that like you were saying in your early days, when you were in your younger days, when you were sort of completely ignorant of it, didn't really, th- you weren't worried about anything, you were just partying. And I think a lot of people are ignorant of the fact that they are going to die. Like you've said, <laughs> there's this solipsistic tendency in everyone that, yeah, it, it, people around me are sort of dropping like flies, but I'm going to be fine. And I've always sort of had one eye on the end. I can have these really maudlin moments <laughs> where, I don't know, maybe we're sat at Christmas dinner and everyone's having having fun and it's joyful and, you know, the kids are there. And then out of nowhere, I'll look at everyone and think, you're all going to be dead one day. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm always very, very conscious of it. Um, I've, I've sort of used it to my advantage as well to as a, a sort of motivating factor. But when I was there for when my dad died and quite literally watched him take his last breath, for me, it was a really transformative experience. There's something really bizarre about watching someone go from a person to an object in real time and... I've said this before in another episode, there was something symbolic about it. Your your father is this sort of leviathan figure in your life. As long as he's not an ass and he has, you know, you've had a good relationship with him. And, you know, my dad was this huge figure to me, even when he wasn't well towards the end and he sort of withered away. He was still this gargantuan figure in my life symbolically. And it was like, oh my God, if if anyone's going to beat death, your dad's going to beat it. And when it took him, it was like, oh shit. It's coming for all of us. Like, this confirmed it. You're next, as it were, because you're the next generation. Yeah, yeah. And so, but that was just one, that was one experience. That's one encounter with death. Whereas you... <laughs> it's when it's your dad, isn't it? Or, you know, someone you really love, like you say, who's been the kind of living embodiment of aliveness and power and strength. And so that was a big deal. But I think, I think with you, you've seen it not just on more frequently, but you've probably seen it in, in its sort of more difficult expressions, I guess. You know, people that have sort of have died of cancer and things like that. And then children, I know we keep coming back to that, but I mean, I have the, as a direct result of, of seeing and reading about things happening to children, you know, my, I'm quite agnostic religiously and my view of that sort of ebbs and flows. But anytime I read about a child getting cancer, for me, I always take that as confirmation. It's just like, oh, forget it. There's, there's no benevolence out there in the universe. But I'm wondering how it's affected your relationship with your own death and your own mortality. So it's both. I mean, I said, so I have... I've given my children all my passwords because so often I've seen people desperately trying to get into their loved ones' email accounts and so and I've prepared so I've told them what I where I want to be crem- cremated where I want my ashes my passwords and I've talked them to them about what I want because I've also seen in families where they have never had those conversations. 70% of families have never talked about what they want or need. You know, do they want to be an organ donor, all of that. So I've done the kind of practical things because I've seen what a nightmare it is. But I think, um, and so, <laughs> this is bad, sometimes when family members are really horrible, I kind of have a kind of, totally narcissistic view is that if I died you'd really miss me and you'll regret it (laughs) (laughs) so but those aren't kind of real and then I think I do I both know and I don't know that I'm gonna die still still I don't think I could wake up every day and think today I could die because it's too much so I think I have to live in 
hippy dippy land that somehow isn't going to really happen to me until I get a diagnosis or um, and then I'll probably be as scared and uh, the rest as everybody else. Yeah, I was going to say, do you in in the, in the moments where you are acknowledging it, does it sort of strike the fear of God into you, so to speak? What strikes the fear of God is how. Right. If I died quickly and painlessly, I'm fine. My idea of it is fine. But the idea of a long, slow death or having a degenerative disease or Alzheimer's or all the stuff I've seen with both my mum and dad, I really don't fancy it much. Yeah, I've got the same me. I think when, whenever I think, if I think of myself just sort of clutching my heart and, and dropping to the pavement one day out of the blue, it's like, eh, but... Or falling asleep in your, uh, for dying in your sleep. Oh, that's the, per- yeah, that's the perfect one. I mean, I don't, I don't know how many of us are lucky enough to actually, My actually mom, get that one. who lived in Denag, um all her life, and she did want, to, I, uh, she would never talk to me about her dying. So I'd say to her, you know, this is age 90, or she'd had a 90th birthday. So anything you want to talk to me about, so anything you're worried about? And then she was given a, te- a, a diagnosis of terminal cancer, and she was told she had six months to live. And um, I went to the doctor with her. And by the time we got home and I said, is there anything you want to talk to me about what the doctor said? She said, no, darling, I've got flu. I'll go better. And <laughs> she just completely binned wow. it. Just like when her brother died. She literally, she, and whatever, I know I didn't want to come in and smash all her defenses that she'd used for 90 years. So I couldn't say, mum, the doctor said you're going to die and you've got six months. Is there anything you want to... So I just said, can you remember what he said? Is there anything you're worried about? Nothing, darling, I'll be fine. Wow. Okay, Julia, I'm conscious that we're going to, we risk ending this on too much of a, (laughs) instilling an existential crisis into all my listeners. So I guess my, my final, final question before I let you go would be. What's positive about death? Yeah, let's go with that. Yeah, let's go with that. I think we feel more alive when we know we're going to die. Even if it's like me that you sort of hope that, you know, that you don't really believe it. But I think there's a lot to learn and we embrace life more with more vitality, more vividly when we're fully aware of our mortality and that we need to talk to the people that we love most about our dying, about their dying so that we don't have regrets, so that we're not so scared, so that we're confident about what they wanted um, and confident about what they thought. We're not left sort of imagining um, did they, would they wish, you know, and feeling guilty. So I think, you know, like we're doing today, the more you talk about these things, the less frightening they become, the less we bury them and hide them away. Um, the more confident we are and the more supported we are to manage them for all of us will be affected by death at some point in our life. Okay, Julia, have you got any um, any links, websites, social media, anything you'd like to direct the listeners towards? So my book you can get at Amazon and it's called Grief Works or I have a website, www.griefworks.co.uk and that has got... My pillar, eight pillars of strength. It's got a whole section on what supports you when you die. Um, I mean, sorry, when you're bereaved. Plus some of my blogs. Um, I haven't done as many as you. And um, lots of press and reviews and, and other people's experiences. So it's a, good, it's a good website. And I'm on Facebook. Okay, well, as usual, I will include links to all those in the show notes. And in the meantime, Julia Samuel, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim. Okay, folks, if you enjoyed this episode or you're enjoying this podcast in general and you'd like to help support it, this is just a quick message to let you know that you can now join our little exclusive members-only community over at Patreon, where for as little as $2 a month, you can gain access to exclusive content like the quickfire questions portion from my interviews and my AMA or Ask Me Anything episodes. There's also a members-only newsletter where I give you a little sneak peek into what kind of guests and content to expect over the coming weeks. You can help me steer the ship a little bit by telling me the kind of content you'd like me to produce. And there's also the opportunity to join a private Facebook group where you can interact directly with myself and fellow patrons to share tips and advice and support one another on your own mental health recovery journeys. 
So if this sounds like a community you'd like to be a part of, please go to patreon.com forward slash my own worst enemy and sign up for as little as $2 a month, which let's face it is less than the price of a coffee and not even one of them like fancy double Belgian chocolate latte bollocks. It's probably cheaper than like a plain old shitty Nescafe from the office vending machine and it won't give you the jitters or make your breath smell of ass. so bargain. Alternatively, for those of you who do want to help support the podcast, but you can't be asked with all the extra bells and whistles, you can make a standard one-time or monthly donation by going to our support page at myownworstenemy.org forward slash support. And that's about it. So, as always, thank you for listening, and I'll see you again next time.